Let us pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you because every time we come together, you're always with us. We're praying that you'll be with us in our study today in Jesus' name. And we pray, O oh Lord, that those who have not known Christ as Savior, they will taste of the grace of God, be forgiven of their sins, be transformed by His grace in Jesus' name. And those of us who have known you as Savior, we pray that you implant your nature in our very hearts and lives in Jesus' name. That as you have given us the example how to live, we'll follow through and follow in the steps of Christ in all we do everywhere, every time in Jesus' name. Teach us by your spirit tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. We keep on in our study of false Peter. And the Lord has granted us chance to make some progress. Now we're in chapter 2. We're reading from verse 21 today. Reading from verse 21. Please open your Bible with me. For even Christ also for here unto were ye called. Because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Tonight, as we look at the life of Christ and the ministry of Christ, his atonement and his death for us, we have quite a lot of things to learn. And I'm just praying that the Lord will keep every one of us awake so we will hear what he wants us to hear and know and will be who he wants us to be in Jesus' name. If you've been following through the teaching of the Apostle Peter, as he wrote to the brethren that were scattered all over Asia Minor, you know that he was talking to people that were already born again, many of them. They were children of God, but they lived in hostile communities. Because of that, they were suffering for their faith. Therefore, he brought them encouragement and exhortation. Even though they were scattered in different places, in the different parts of Asia Minor, he needed to strengthen them in their faith. How did he do that? He did that by reminding them of the hope they had in Christ. Reminded them of the holiness they ought to live in Christ. He also reminded them of the harmony they ought to have, even in the hostile environment. Here today now, he gives us the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Reminding them, he has already said, they were strangers, foreigners, pilgrims here in the world. He was challenging them. They had responsibilities as citizens in the nations in which they were. And in their various employments, they had also duties to carry out as servants of earthly human masters. In their pilgrimage and in the course of performing their duties, he reminded them they might suffer wrongfully. But then they were to bear everything patiently and for the grace of God in their lives. And this, is Christ, uh, this, is, this was Christ's response as he suffered to and he committed himself unto his father. And uh, the apostle is telling us that it was not only Christ. Christ has given us the example. We ought to follow in his footsteps. Look at that verse 21 again. For even hereunto were ye called. Our calling is not only to salvation. Our calling is to suffer persecution as well. It's part of the deal. It's part of the calling that he has given us. Then he said because Christ also suffered for us. He didn't just suffer and he didn't suffer for himself. He suffered for us. In suffering for us, he has left us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. And as we look at the life of Christ tonight, I want to remind you that that's exactly what uh, the Lord wants to uh, do in your life and in my life. He wants us to look at the example of Christ. He wants us to see the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ as it were calling you. Look at the footprints of the Lord Jesus and put your feet at the very places he put his feet. 
so that your life your character everything about you will be conformed to the very life of the lord jesus christ paul tells us in romans chapter 8 verse 29 romans chapter 8 verse 29 for whom he did for no he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of a son conformed to the image of his son why so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren so then as we look at the study today we're looking at how to follow in the example of christ he suffered patiently well to suffer patiently and graciously too he suffered and while suffering he kept on loving and we're to suffer persecution or whatever it is and while we suffer we keep on loving not only that he committed himself unto god in his suffering that's what we are to do we're not to complain we're not to murmur we're to com commit ourselves unto god in our suffering then he kept on praying and serving the lord while suffering isn't that an example for us he's telling us that while we keep on suffering persecution or whatever may come our way we don't stop praying we don't stop serving while we're suffering not only that he kept on caring for all the people while he was suffering we see that through the life of jesus christ and we're called upon to follow the example of christ we keep on serving we keep on caring for others while we're suffering not only that he remained faithful unto god the lord that had called him remain in the will of god while he was suffering that's our calling suffering will come pain will come persecution will come we must remain in the center of the will of god while we're suffering there are three points we're going to consider number one the purpose and the pattern of christ's suffering why did he suffer and what's the pattern uh, what does he reveal in his suffering that we're going to see and it's a pattern an example for you and for me number two pardon and purity through christ our sin bearer peter was very quick to remind them we do not need to bear our sins again he bore everything for us we can now repent we can forsake our sins leave everything behind come under the banner of christ who bore our sins for us and then number three protection and preservation under christ our shepherd let's go back to number one the purpose and the pattern of christ's suffering you see there are two parts there we're going to look at number one the purpose of the suffering of christ number two the pattern of the suffering of christ number one the purpose look at uh, chapter 2 first peter here we're looking at first peter chapter 2 verse 21 it says for even here unto what you call because christ also suffered for us christ suffered for us the suffering that jesus went through it wasn't for any sin that he had committed he never sinned at all he was pure he was perfect he was holy he was righteous and yet he suffered you say why will a righteous man why will the righteous perfect son of god suffer well because it had been prophesied in the old testament that you will take a lamp a lamp without blemish a lamp without spot you kill that animal you shed the blood because the children of israel should have died but then they will apply the blood of the perfect stainless spotless lamp upon the doorposts of their houses and the lord said when i see that blood i will take that blood as a substitute for yourself then i will pass over you and it was a picture a symbol for jesus christ that's why jesus came Behold the lamp of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He lived a perfect life. That's a perfect lamb. The spotless lamb. The stainless lamb. And then he gave his life for us. That's the purpose of his suffering. It says Christ suffered for us. He went through all that he went through because of us. Look at chapter 3 of 1 Peter verse 18. For Christ also as once suffered for sins. Which sins? your sins and my sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god be put to death in the flesh but quickened made alive by the spirit he died he rose again but you know why he suffered he suffered so that he can bring us to god our sins separated us from god but now he has suffered for us so that we will not remain separated from the lord in fact uh, hebrews chapter 2 tells us this way he tasted death for every man the punishment he should have borne 
the death you should have undergone and the pain you should have had jesus bore that for you and then for me hebrews chapter 2 reading from verse 9 and verse 10 but we see jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of god should taste death for every man that tells us that jesus died for everyone everyone the young and the old the children and the adults the students the youth everybody he died for every one of us so that we will not die again so that we will not uh, bear the punishment of our sins he tasted death for every man the bible says the soul that sinneth it shall die therefore you are going on the way of death on the way of eternal death on the way of eternal perdition but then christ came he says, I love you so much. Your soul is so precious to me. I do not want you to undergo eternal punishment. I will bear your punishment for you. The wages of sin hanging upon you, I'll bear it for you. He tasted death for every man. That's why every man has the chance, the opportunity, the liberty to come to the Lord today and say, Lord, you died for me. I don't need to die that death kind of death again. I do not to die this. I do not need to die the second death. You can remove me from all the perdition and all the cause and the lord will do it because he did it for you he bore the punishment already look at verse 10 it says for it became him it befitted him uh, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering his ministry was perfected his atonement was accepted because he died for you come back to first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 21 then we go on to verses 22 and 23 it says for even here unto were ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we shall follow in his steps listen to verse 22 who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth who when he was reviled he reviled not again when he suffered he threatened not but committed himself unto him that judges righteously here we learn about the lord jesus christ he did no sin have you noticed how many people gave testimony as to the sinlessness the perfection the holiness the righteousness of the life of christ as we go through the bible you will find that unbelievers even uh, spoke about him and then a uh, backslider spoke about him and then even the people that we would have thought would have condemned him they found no sin they found no blemish in him let's just look at a few of the testimonies about the lord jesus christ in matthew chapter 27 reading from verse 4 seen i have seen in that i have betrayed the innocent blood that's judas iscariot the betrayer he said i know jesus is innocent i know that he has no sin in chapter 27 verse 19 when he was set down on the judgment seat his wife sent unto him saying have thou nothing to do with that just man for i have suffered many things this day listen to this in the dream because of him it says have nothing to do with that just man just man righteous holy innocent just that's what the wife of pilate said concerning the lord jesus christ in verse 23 of that same chapter the governor said why what evil has he done but they cried out the more saying let him be crucified in verse 24 when pilate saw that he could do nothing he could prevail nothing but rather a tumult was made he took a water and washed his hand before the multitude saying i am innocent of the blood of this just person therefore you will see the testimony concerning christ that he was just he had no sin at all and i've told you already from the scriptures that he died he suffered not for his own sins but for yours and mine so that we who are far away from god we who are sinners will be brought near unto the lord in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 second corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 it says for he made him to be seen for us that is sacrifice for sin sin offering for us who knew no sin you see that that's talking about christ even though he was made a sin offering 
even though he suffered for us even though he had to be sacrificed he became the pascal lamb the sacrificial lamb he knew no sin in fact that was what qualified him to be the sacrificial lamb if he had had any sin at all within or without any single day he would not have been qualified to be the lamb without blemish and without spot the very fact that he knew no sin qualified him to die for you and for me then it says in that verse 21 that we might be made the righteousness of god in him but now we come back to chapter 2 of uh, first peter we're told that now we're born again we're children of god our sins are forgiven why because christ the innocent one the just one the righteous one the holy one the perfect the pure one he suffered for us he bore our own sins and therefore we can now go free but then we're not being told his attitude during that suffering is a disposition conduct and character during that period of suffering that was not just suffering that he did not merit please come back uh, to first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 21 for here for even here to here unto were ye called because christ also suffered for us in suffering for us he has given us salvation is suffering for us he has shed his blood is suffering for us we are cleansed by the blood of the lamb that was shed for us more than that as we are coming to the kingdom of god he has not left us an example that we should follow in his steps how are we to follow in his steps he tells us he says in verse 22 who did no sin are you to follow in his steps you also will do no sin you also will not continue in sin he says shall we continue in sin that grace may abound he says god forbid he says we are dead to sin he says we reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin it says that now we are free to live the righteous life it says be ye holy because i am holy he says he that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure it says whosoever is born of god does not commit sin neither will he continue in any form of sin why the seed of god remains in him he cannot sin he will not sin he must not sin because of the new nature of christ in him that's what christ did he did no sin he left us that example he was holy and righteous we too should be holy and righteous neither was guile found in his mouth what an example neither should guile be found in our mouth neither should corruption be found in our mouth neither should deceit be found in our mouth then he said who when he was reviled he reviled not again he was insulted you know the many things they said about him they said this fellow they called him this fellow that was an insultive kind of terminology used for christ but he didn't respond he didn't react negatively to that they will insult you too they will abuse you too they will mistreat you too just like jesus christ has given us the example he was reviled he reviled not again they even said that he was casting out devils by the spirit of beelzebub that he is by the god of flies dirty uh, dirty flies they said that you don't mind him that all that he's doing is doing by the power of demons he didn't react to that he didn't say anything about that when they reviled him he did not revile back again this fellow he saved others himself he cannot save he will not respond to them he's giving us an example and he's saying that whatever we're going through the pain the suffering the mistreatment and the torture whatever it is we should not respond unto them he says when he was reviled he reviled not again when he suffered he threatened not he could have called down ten thousand angels in fact he told peter when peter was trying to defend him he pulled out his sword to cut off the ear of one of the people that came to take the lord jesus christ he said put your sword back we don't fight like the people of the world like they do he says don't you think if i wanted to i could have called 12 legions of angels and they will come immediately to for my defense but he said how will the will of god be done because everything i'm going through has an end as a purpose and it's an example for us we may have the ability and the power and the authority uh, to be able to revenge but no we cannot revenge no we cannot retaliate no we cannot threaten no we cannot punish the people that persecute us that's why it says when he suffered he threatened not but he committed himself unto him that judges righteously he committed himself to the 
father and he knew that he was in the center of the will of the father and he rejoiced in that and he remained in that and he abode in that in first peter chapter 4 first peter chapter 4 verse 19 wherefore let him let them that suffer according to the will of god you know there is suffering according to the will of god there is persecution according to the will of God. Let them that suffer according to the will of God. If you know you are a child of God and you see that you have not deviated from the word of God, you have not deviated from the will of God, you know by the grace of God, by his enablement, you are standing in the very center of the will of God. If persecution comes, praise the Lord. If pain comes, praise the Lord. If suffering comes, praise the Lord. Only examine your heart, examine your life when that suffering comes am i in the center of the will of god if you are in the center of the will of god wherefore then let them that suffer according to the will of god commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator and so you will see what jesus christ has done you will see that he left us an example he never complained he never murmured he never retaliated he never sought to revenge he never was bitter he never did anything that will fight back you throw some you throw something at me i throw the same thing or something uh, was a uh, back at you no jesus never did that and we should not do that come back now again to your first peter Chapter 2, I'm reading again from verse 21. For even here unto were ye called, uh, people say, I'm called to be an evangelist, wonderful. Called to be a preacher, wonderful. Called to be a minister, wonderful. Called to be a missionary, wonderful. Have you considered your calling to suffer? Here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps and while you are going through that persecution it may be that uh, your parents misunderstand you they misunderstand that you know you are born again now things are different you cannot uh, buy the secret again you cannot do those evil things again you cannot tell lies they are not at home again because of that persecution will come it may be you are living with a brother living with a sister and you are trying to take your stand you say this is the word of god therefore i cannot help you in that area you are calling me to help you and they may misunderstand you they say you don't have love because of that that may cost you some suffering and sometimes too you may be sick you are a child of god and the devil is not happy don't you know that the suffering of christ was caused by men by demons by satan in fact it says uh, the seed of the serpent will bruise your heel therefore we know that satan had a part in the suffering of jesus christ satan may not be happy you have left his camp he may cause you some suffering there may be pain of poverty it may be that uh, some of our students who are a child of god and because other people have cheated in the exam they cancelled that paper and yet you did right and you, you used your brain a suffering when the day when success is delayed like that and when you suffer like that you commit yourself into the hands of god it may be that you are afraid to marry and uh, you want to get married because of one hitch some way or the other uh, you are suffering the marriage is delayed the blessing is delayed there is disappointment one way or the other we are not to threaten i will leave the church we are not to threaten i will leave that district we are not to threaten them i will do this i will do that you commit yourself into the hands of the lord while you are suffering because christ has left us an example that we should follow in his steps but now before i leave that part I need to point out something in first uh, first uh, corinthians first corinthians chapter 14 first corinthians chapter 14 i'm reading there from verse 20 first corinthians chapter 14 reading from verse 20 it says brethren be not children in understanding how be it in malice which ye children but in understanding be men is calling us to maturity instead of childishness and we have looked at the life of jesus christ and we have looked at the uh, at his reaction his response to suffering his response to insult his response to persecution his response to those negative things they heaped upon him but please my brothers and sisters don't take that to mean that jesus christ compromised with evil never 
don't take that to be interpreted that he failed to warn sinners he failed to rebuke backsliders he failed to correct his disciples never and we're not talking about when correction is necessary christ will correct in fact he'll correct so effectively about when we're suffering persecution is what we're talking about you're suffering persecution in the home you're suffering a kind of mistreatment somewhere you'll be very patient you'll bear it graciously you're very quiet you'll not threaten you will not revenge but when it comes to somebody bringing false doctrine into the district our coordinators our leaders cannot say well jesus was quiet therefore i will be quiet i will not rebuke by slider i will not correct evil no we cannot do that we must follow the example of jesus christ fully and wholeheartedly let me show you the example of jesus christ in matthew chapter 16 matthew chapter 16 i'm reading verse 23 but he turned and said unto peter get thee behind me satan thou art an offense unto me for thou savorest not the things that be of god but those that be of men uh, peter was saying something contrary to the will of god contrary to the word of god and christ was very quick to bring him back they are going the wrong way peter in fact satan is giving you that idea and that thought don't think like that again if you do like that you'll be an offense unto the will of god and the plan of god in uh, matthew chapter 21 matthew chapter 21 verses 12 and 13 and jesus went into the temple of god and he cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of money changers and the seat of them that sold those and he said unto them it is written my house shall be called the house of prayer but ye have made it a den of thieves you understand when you see that the house of god is being desecrated oh you cannot say well we're supposed to be quiet we're supposed not to talk at all everything is supposed to be handed over to the devil if he wants to turn the worship upside down uh, we must not say anything because we are to follow the example of jesus christ no when they have personal injury against you when they insult you in a personal way that's the way you are not to react that's when you are to act at jesus and be very quiet but when the house of god is desecrated and the worship of god is uh, turned upside down you are to be like christ whenever you can and you are to bring correct how about if there are sinners that are in their sin and they will be able they will be misleading other people to go the way of hell instead of going the way of heaven are you going to keep quiet what did jesus do matthew chapter 23 i'm reading from verse 13 matthew 23 i'm reading from verse 13 but woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer them that are entering in to go in. You see that when uh, Pharisees misled other people, misguided other people, wanting to turn them to the way of hell, instead of the way of heaven, Jesus will not be happy about that. And therefore he spoke to them very sharply, and he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, because uh, you are trying to preach, but you are preaching false doctrine. And instead of leading people the right way you are leading them the wrong way brothers and sisters understand then when we talk about following the example of christ we follow the example of christ in every way when we are personally injured be quiet be patient bear it graciously when the honor of god the word of god the will of god the worship of god is tampered with rise up like christ and go against it in matthew chapter 26 verses 24 and 25 matthew 26 24 it says the son of man goeth as it is written of him but what to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed it had been good for that man that he had not been born and judas which betrayed him answered and said master is it i and he said thou hast said you will not well fail to warn the people that are going the wrong way and the people that you know their action will lead them in eternity perdition you will not uh, just keep quiet and say well i'm following the example of jesus the example of jesus is that he will warn the people that are going the way of perdition in mark chapter 3 i'm looking at mark chapter 3 from verse 1 
Mark chapter 3 from verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand. And he watched him whether he will, he will heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And then it says, and he said unto the man which had the withered hand stand forth. And he said unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil to save life or to kill but they held their peace he knew their heart he knew what they were watching for they didn't want that man to be healed there was wickedness in their heart look at verse 5 and when he had looked round about them with anger being grieved for the hardness of their heart he was grieved because they knew the truth they will not follow the truth he was grieved because uh, they, they, they knew that this man needed healing they didn't have the mercy of god in their hearts he looked around them with anger and then he was grieved for the hardness of their heart he said unto the man stretch forth thine hand and he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other i'm now in luke chapter 11. in luke chapter 11 we're looking at it from verse 52. luke 11 verse 52. Here we read, Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken the, away the key of knowledge, and ye enter not in yourselves, and them that are entering in, ye have hindered. You see what Jesus, what pain Jesus Christ, the people that put themselves as preachers, they were preaching false doctrine, and the people were believing them, and these were doctors of the law, he called, they were called lawyers, not the ordinary lawyers, the people that were, uh, that were versed in the law, of God according to the tradition of the Jews. But they were not teaching them the right thing. He wasn't happy about that. And he said, woe unto you lawyers because you have taken away the key of knowledge. And then you will not allow the people to use the key themselves and open the door and get in and you have shut the door. You have not entered in yourself and the people that are entering in, you are hindering them. In Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13 reading from verse 1. There were present at the at the season at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering at them said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such as I tell you nay, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Jesus never deceived anyone. We're not talking about being so kind and gentle and loving we don't tell the truth anymore we're not talking about being so reserved and quiet and silent and then we want to just go on quietly if people are living in sin in their drunkenness and their smoking in their adultery in their fornication their occultism we keep quiet because you know we're to follow the example of jesus christ he was patient and silent and no we're to warn the sinners and we're to tell them like jesus told them except ye repent ye shall likewise perish come back to first peter chapter 2 when there is personal offense when you are injured in a personal way when you are mistreated in any way and when you are persecuted and you are suffering and you, you, they do not have any right to put that kind of suffering on you the example of jesus christ is that you will not defend yourself you will not revenge you will not retaliate you will not say anything uh, that will that will hurt uh, those people because they caused you suffering because here unto are you called christ also suffered for you and he has left you an example that you should follow in his steps he did no sin he also you are not to sin neither was god found in his mouth this uh, deception should not be found in your mouth who when he was reviled he reviled not again don't abuse others don't insult them don't threaten them and then it says when he suffered he threatened not but he committed himself unto him that judges righteously come to point number two pardon and purity through christ our sin bearer that we find in verse 24 in verse 24 it says who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we 
being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Here we are told uh, the reason why Christ suffered for us. Here we are told uh, the pardon he purchased for us. The redemption he purchased for us. The righteousness he purchased for us. We are told that he bought our sins on the tree because the cross was made of wood, wood coming from the tree. And it says the reason he did that is that we will be dead unto sin and will live unto righteousness. We are told in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, reading from verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we did hear as it were faces from him, and he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief, and he has carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And then he says, with his stripes were healed. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's telling us he bore our sins. Therefore, we can be forgiven now. We can be pardoned now. We can be saved now. We can have the grace of God in our lives now and have transformation of life. And see, his attitude during that suffering verse 7 he was oppressed he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers a dog he openeth not his mouth and then we're told in verse 9 and then he says he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death because he has done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth in verse 11 he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities he did that to bear our iniquities to bear our sins that's why john the baptist when he saw jesus christ coming one day he knew that he had come to fulfill all that had been written in the old testament concerning the sacrifice the sacrificial lamb in John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, uh, The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him, and he says, Behold the Lamb, behold the perfect Lamb, behold the pardoning Lamb, behold the one that draws us to the Lord, behold the one that is to be our substitute, our sin bearer, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Anyone in the world, anywhere in the world, can be saved, can be born again. As a result of what Jesus Christ has done. Because it is through him, we now can have repentance. Through him, we can be restored into the grace of God. Through him, we can have redemption, regeneration. Through him, we can have the riches of the kingdom of God. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts, chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. And the God, the God of our fathers, raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. You slew him, he said. You killed him, he said. And then he, you hanged him on a tree. Him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. And for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That's what the Lord has done for us. He died for us so that we'll be able to have redemption. We'll be able to have remission of sins. The removal of our sins. If you're still there today and you have any sin in your life, you're still there today. You're burdened with the guilt and condemnation of your sin. You can call upon the Lord. Actually, he has died for you to take all your sins away. And he can renew you and bring about in your life pardon, purity. He can bring about in your life redemption, reconciliation with God. In uh, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, looking at it from verse 6, it tells us that but now we are delivered from the law. Uh, how? By being dead therein, wherein we were held. That is, uh, were held in that sin before the chain of sin held us, chain of smoking held us, chain of drunkenness, immorality held us. But now it says Christ died for us. He took a place for us. And because of his atonement, the chain is broken. 
we are no more held. We are now dead to the sin that we shall serve him in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Have you noticed what he said in First Peter? In First Peter chapter 2, there in verse 24, have you noticed the, the result of the atonement? The result of what Jesus suffered, what he did for you and for me on the cross of Calvary. It says in the middle there, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. That is, because of what Christ has done. Now we can live unto righteousness. Romans expansiates that very much. Look at Romans chapter 6. Reading from verse 1. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in our adultery, in our fornication? After all, the grace of God is, is said, no. God forbid. How shall we? that are dead to sin live any longer therein therefore what peter was telling those people that was scattered in the various parts of asia minor he was telling them he died on the tree he bore our sins on the tree so that we will not bear them again so that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness the same thing peter paul here is emphasizing how can we how shall we that are not dead to sin live any longer daring? He said, don't you know, in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. In verse 11, likewise reckon ye yourself also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In verse 12 it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you shall obey it in the laws thereof. It says, Don't allow it. Sin will try to gain entrance again. And sin will try to re-enter into your life. He said, you can't permit that. You can't allow that. He died for you on the cross so that you'll be saved. You know, there are some people, they think being saved means that we are forgiven. And then we're given license to go ahead and be committing other sins. According to them, they say, all your sins are forgiven. The past, the present, the future sins. Everything has been forgiven. You have the license, go ahead and be living in sin. There's nothing like that in the Bible. Nothing like that in the Old Testament or the New Testament, especially when Christ came and then he died for us, especially when Christ suffered and died for us, especially when Christ shed his blood so that all our sins can be taken away and so that he'll implant, implant his nature in us. It says there's nothing like continuing in sin. Therefore, you will not allow sin to reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the laws thereof. It tells us in verse 18 of that same chapter 6, Then being then made free from sin. You see that? If you are born again, if you are a child of God, if you have really known the Lord, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22, it says, But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So then we understand what the Lord is telling us is that a new life has come, a new nature has come, and the sins who are living in before, reveling in before, rejoicing in before, taking pride in them before, we don't have them anymore now. If you have truly met Christ, your life has changed. The things you did before, you do them no more. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. First John chapter 3, reading from verse 5. First John chapter 3, reading from verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, not to add to our sins. Not to teach us how to commit more sins. Not to excuse us in committing more sins. He was manifested that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. You are abiding in Christ. You are abiding in the salvation of the Lord. You are abiding in the redemption that the Lord has purchased and made for you. Whosoever abideth in him, a student, a youth, a young fellow, or an adult, whosoever it says abideth in him sinneth not whosoever sinneth has not seen him neither known him little children let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous he that committeth sin tell me the rest tell me out loud 
Yes, he that committed sin is of the devil. You see somebody saying, I'm born again, still smoking, born again, still drinking, born again, uh, still in polygamy, born again, still adultery is there, fornication is there, born again, lying is still there, born again, fraud is still there, born again, and doing evil things. The Bible is very clear that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sin it from the beginning. Listen to this. For this purpose, for this reason, for this goal, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was manifested that he might do what? Destroy the works of the devil. Sinning, that's the work of the devil. All the evil things that people do, the wickedness and the malice and the fighting and the strife and the violence is the work of the devil. Killing one another is the work of the devil. All the abortion is the work of the devil. It's not the spirit of God leading people to do that. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's why it says in verse 9, Whosoever is born of God, God does not commit sin and for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin why because he is born of God are you born of God if you are born of God you will show it by the evidence of your life the sins of the past, the lying of the past, the evil of the past, and the nightclubs of the past, the rebellion of the past, the wild parties of the past, uh, the, 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 the idol worship of the past, the juju of the past, and the occultism of the past. All those things will not be in your life again. And so we have pardon, we have purity through Jesus Christ, our Savior and sin bearer. Now he tells us in verse 25, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, For ye were sheep going astray. But now I returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. He now tells us that these uh, people, they had gone astray before. Because he said, ye were. That's past tense. And that talks about us as well. And that's how we were. When we didn't have Christ, when we didn't have salvation, we were a sheep going astray. When he talks of sheep going astray, that's a pitiful situation indeed. Either a single sheep or a flock of sheep going astray will be exposed unto a lot of dangers when you don't have christ you are like that you do not have the shepherd you do not have the bishop of the soul getting you back to the true fold you are like that but you can come to the lord tonight and then the danger of uh, destruction the lord will take away from your life in isaiah chapter 55 chapter 23 isaiah 53 verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all when the lord lays the your iniquity on the lord then you're free to come back home you're free to come back to the fold your sins are forgiven everything is taken away and then he begins to take care of you as a shepherd will take care of the sheep you are born again, you become saved, you become forgiven, all your sins are pardoned. But it's not only that, there is our shepherd and bishop of our soul, he does even more for us. In Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, reading there in verses 20 and 21, it says now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, and through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, walking in you, that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to him to whom be glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. The Lord himself is uh, bringing us back home. Already he has forgiven you if you are born again. That not only to forgive you, he can make you faithful unto the end. And as your shepherd, as the bishop of your soul, he will keep you from falling in Jesus' name. In Jude, Jude, second to the last book of the New Testament. In Jude, verse 24, it says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. The Lord is able to keep you from falling. If you have not been saved, he's able to save you today. If you have not been sanctified, he's able to sanctify you today. If you have been saved and sanctified, he's able to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. He's able to put power, unction, authority into your life. And if you are walking in the Lord, temptations are coming, trials are coming, he will hold your hand. 
he will keep you from falling and he has gone to prepare a place for you in heaven you will not miss your place in heaven in jesus name you will rise up and tell the lord you are not strong but he is strong and you, you are not a perfect but he is perfect and he's able to cleanse you more and more he's able to wash you more and more he's able to make you steady more and more he's able to make you steadfast and faithful more and more he's able to keep you until the final day the devil may think you are not going to make it but by the strength of the lord by the power of the lord you can make it the bishop of your soul will not allow you to go astray you talk to the lord and say lord i want you to keep me and the lord will keep you in a time of trial in a time of persecution in a time when they are doing when they misunderstand you and they mistreat you just resign yourself to the lord commit yourself to the lord don't allow them to make you angry to make you fight back to make you retaliate to make you seek revenge have the grace of god in your life that will be quiet when they are noisy that you will be praying for them you love them when they are manifesting hatred towards you but when false doctrine wants to come rise up and honestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints